So, with the right stuff here, I'm kind of trusting a little bit to your expertise and excitement about this one. I mean, because I watched the movie, I did some research, and I read the book. But at the same time, I feel like you're going to have a lot more insight when we get into kind of the nuts and bolts and, and nitty gritty here. We'll see. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 Put, put, put the pressure on you there. So what I kind of wanted to start with before we get into the movie itself, and I started doing a little bit of research down this line and then kind of realized, eh, maybe this is a little too much. So we'll just kind of talk about it in loose terms. But I wanted to talk about the history of transportation itself, because I feel like that's something that we haven't really addressed yet head on. And this movie, more than any other on the list thus far, you could definitely argue is in many ways about transportation. I know that's a very, <laughs> that's not the theme or anything, <laughs> but it with what it deals with, with, you know, initially talking about, you know, the race to break the sound barrier and then, you know, the first astronauts. It, there's definitely something about human transportation and the frontiers of that at play. So I kind of wanted to rewind because we've never really talked about any of that stuff before. And again, this is just in very broad strokes. Man started walking. (laughs) No, and then obviously it's kind of the stuff we already know. The timeline, just what I kind of looked at briefly, was a little surprising though. That basically the use of animals to help us get around on and the invention of the wheel were actually right around the same time. Around, it looked like 4000 BC, give or take. So I thought it was interesting that both those things happened about the same time. And then you have boats and seafaring ways of transportation were... But then, outside of those things, wheel, animal, and the sea, you don't have a lot of new breakthroughs other than those things all getting better. So yes, you get better forms of wheel transportation. You get much better forms of things happening in the water. But beyond that, it doesn't really escalate drastically until about the 17th, 18th century. And then what I thought was interesting too, the other thing that kind of paired out is I'm kind of surprised the bicycle wasn't invented sooner. From what I was seeing on the bicycle, it was around this time frame, basically just before you get external combustion and the railroads, the, the bicycle was almost the contemporary of that. So, I mean, you could see a scenario where, because the bicycle is so just mechanical and nothing chemical, no explosions, or anything. So why wasn't the bicycle invented in the 1100s? And I, I don't know. Maybe a bunch of people like tried to invent it, but they kept falling over or something. They no, just, true. Like, this is impossible. It down. <laughs> yes, honestly, true. You got to kind of trust the physics of a, a wheel like that with inline wheels. So, yeah, good point. And then, yeah, so then you had with the railroad, that that was a huge game changer. And, you know, you you know, submarines were happening around that time as well. Then the next big breakthrough comes with, well, I was going to say flight, but the precursor to airplanes and what we're going to deal with today would be like hot air balloons. So hot air balloons were were used uh, before. And I even saw that they were using them in the Civil War to just kind of help with scouting. And that you could basically raise a hot air balloon well above a battlefield to kind of, or a a situation to kind of get a good take on the situation there. And then, yes, as we enter the 20th century, this is where we just hit that, you know, talk about technology being an exponential process. Man, the 20th century, we've talked about before how I kind of think it's probably going to start to level off compared to what happened during the 20th century. And yes, so, you know, the Wright brothers and other people around the world dealing with the beginnings of manned flight. And what we get into today, and this is where I was hoping you'd have a little more information than me, is so obviously the Wright brothers was, you know, kind of more of a prop plane versus jets and rocket propulsion that, again, rockets have their own kind of history as projectiles, not as transportation. And then kind of the marriage of the two in jet planes and rocket ships. Right. There's a scene in the movie, uh, one of the press conferences where John Glenn talks about like the... Kitty Hawk. He talks about the Wright brothers. And that was like, you know, that was only, I mean, the the Wright brothers flew their their Wright flyer in 1903. And this was 1960 or 1961. So in less than 60 years, we go from no one's ever flown an airplane before to shooting people in outer space. Right. And then Jaeger, too, going for the sound barrier in 47. So just, what, 43 years after man first flies, man flew a jet plane faster than the speed of sound? Yes. So, yes, uh, today's movie, The the Right Stuff, does follow the first U.S. astronauts. They call them the Mercury astronauts. Basically, it's just kind of that stage of the mission. 
This is in the early stages of NASA. The movie didn't really talk about it, but in the book, they even talk about when these guys were first recruited, it wasn't even yet called NASA. And just the name NASA, it was even kind of developed around the time they were training these initial astronauts. And then tied with that, because it didn't happen much before, is Chuck Yeager bringing the sound barrier in 47 and the yeah. idea that they that they recruited for these first astronauts, test pilots, which, as they show a little bit in the movie, was not the obvious choice because the, they didn't want to deal with the arrogance and hotheadedness of the test pilots. They, they were well known for their egos and their volatility. And actually, I, I forgot these guys were in it, but it's uh, Jeff Goldblum and Harry Shearer are the yes. two guys charged with kind of recruiting the astronauts. And they're one of my favorite parts of the movie. Oh, absolutely. They're the comic relief. Their interactions with the astronauts and their interactions with each other. And like, yes. you know, the recurring joke of uh, Jeff Goldblum running down the hallway and he opens the door, you know, it's called Sputnik. We know. Sit down. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they've sent a man up there. It's Gagarin. We know. Sit down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love those guys. And just, just the dry sense of humor and the, like you said, the play back and forth uh, between them. And I had forgotten how funny this movie was, which I think is what also makes the runtime fly by. This is over yeah. three hours and it didn't feel like a, a minute over two. Like I just thought it flew by and you're so engaged. And partly because I think, well, the characters and then also they just kind of keep you honestly smiling uh, throughout a lot more than, than you would expect. Uh, so what I was going to say is, so those two guys, when they're kind of in the meetings with Eisenhower and LBJ, who is what, the Secretary of State at the time? Or what was his role? LBJ, he was, he was a senator at the He's time. He's a senator. Okay, that's right. Yeah, yeah, And they talk about, uh, they you know, maybe we could get like acrobats, the guys that are shot out of cannons, or we could get, uh, who else do they list? They list multiple options. Uh, so well, I, I I don't know I don't know how historically accurate that was. I couldn't find anything whether they actually considered all those different types of people. But yeah, it was like it was acrobats, circus performers that get shot out of cannons, surfers. It was like yeah, all these like kind of uh, veritable freak show of different kinds of people that they were you know considering for their new astronaut program. And then somebody suggests test pilots. As I think it's Eisenhower in the movie. It, it is Eisenhower himself. Yeah. Yeah. And they're like, oh no, it, it some other type of person, any other type of person. <laughs> and uh, race car drivers was another one they mentioned. Like you said. Oh, that's right. So yeah, Eisenhower steps up, and they basically are trying to talk him out of it because they just don't think they would be uh, a good a good fit. So. I don't know if that scene in the movie is specifically historical. It, honestly, it's probably a little bit too much happening at one time in a, you know, a five-minute span. But yes, from reading the book, they didn't think of test pilots early on, from what I remember reading. That it was just like, yes, it seems obvious looking back, but they either didn't think of it or didn't want to go that rate. So that that was accurate. Well, and they, they weren't necessarily like concerned with having someone actually fly anything. Right. They just wanted to put a person inside of it. Right, which is why, why not have a circus person who's just used to flying? They, they, you're right, they weren't right. thinking about pilots. And honestly, and that's part of what the movie deals with heavily is the pilot's desire to be pilots. Yes, and in the case, well, in countless cases throughout the history of the entire space program, but in the movie specifically, uh, in, in John Glenn's flight, you really see like, okay, this is where it's important to actually have a pilot who knows what they're doing and can make decisions. Yes, yes. The one thing that kind of stuck out for me is, so there's obviously they're wanting to be the first person into space from the Americans. Of course, then the Russians end up beating us to space. Yep. And then the Americans still want to have the pride of being the first American. Then we enter the whole idea of sending a chimp up first. And obviously the guys are really upset by this. But what kind of comes out in the middle of one of their heated discussions is we're not mad that they're sending a monkey to do our job. We're mad because basically we're being sent up to do a monkey's job because they aren't asking right. enough from us. Right. And I thought that was very, very interesting, just kind of that that dynamic. So, yeah, so, I mean, the movie, even though it's an over three-hour movie, the plot overall is pretty straightforward. It's more just kind of getting to know these characters and just kind of a lot of the individual flights. Yeah, and it goes in chronological order, which I, I haven't read the book, but you said that the book does not. Is that correct? Well, no, actually, I think that's maybe me or misunderstanding the timeline. So when they show Jaeger crash at the end of the movie, was that chronologically in real life after 
all the guys had gone up into space. Because when I read in the book, I got the feeling that it was happening not that late in the timeline. But that, but that may be the case. But if it was, then yeah, I just kind of misread that. So I think the book probably is chronological then, if that's the case. Uh, it, yeah, that was in 1963. Okay. Yes, that crash that they show in the movie is chronologically at the end. So it is, the movie is in chronological order. Okay. I just misunderstood that when I read the book then. Yeah, it, it starts off, I think it's in like the mid 50s, right? When all the. Uh, well, the 40s because the sound barrier. It starts off with Chuck Yeager breaking the sound barrier. But then they jump into the 50s. Yeah, but li- like you said before, the like jet engine technology and space travel rocket technology both kind of developed a- about the same time, like right after World War II, is when you start to see airplanes with jet engines as well as rockets and basically world war ii was kind of a driving force for all that technology i mean obviously jet plane technology because everybody wanted to have jet aircraft like jet military aircraft that could outrun any other they'd be faster than any other military aircraft prop driven at the time i didn't even think about that you have world war ii where air power was a huge part of it but basically everybody on both sides just had prop planes and then two yes. years after the war, we're breaking the sound barrier in a jet plane where if you, we had just had that two years earlier, what kind of impact could that have had on the war with what kind of air exactly. superiority would you have had? Well, maybe not that much because the Nazis were big pioneers in rocket technology and uh, jet engine technology. The first like jet fighter aircraft was a uh, German uh, a Messerschmitt aircraft. So the Germans were beating us. Okay, so everybody was getting them about the same time. Okay, and so if anything, we could have been at risk of being on the a bad side of that, where the Germans have the jets and we don't. And arguably, we had World War II not ended when it did. We might have gotten out technology by the Germans because, well, perfect example in the movie we see uh, Warner von Braun, and he, along with a bunch of other German and yes, former Nazi scientists, were basically routed up by the United States after World War II in a a mission called Operation Paperclip, which was basically uh, the U.S. trying to get all of these uh, scientists that had specifically scientists that had um, expertise in like things like jet engines, rocket engines, rocket guidance to America because they didn't want them to uh, fall into the hands of the Russians. And the Russians got a bunch, too. And they they uh, they reference that in the movie when Sputnik first goes up and they they ask, you know, oh, was it was it their Germans? Is, is that who got him into space? And what if Bob says, no, our Germans are better than their, their Germans. <laughs> <laughs> um, looking at the Wikipedia page and the list of historical accuracies or inaccuracies, they do say one of the things, though, in the movie that is not correct is the German engineers in charge of the U.S. kind of rockets and stuff. That's not correct. They were not German in in real life. Well, so the, the German the inaccuracy is the scene where they're building the capsule and the, that whole team of, of engineers oh, there is okay. all Germans. Okay. But the United States definitely had Germans. Right. So I was kind of confused. Uh, working right. on rockets. Okay. So if anything, they just kind of combine them all into the group of Germans as opposed to focusing on the Americans that were also working with the Germans and working on different things. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I I just want to clarify. So earlier before when I said that, you know, that these scientists were Nazis, technically, yes, that's true. Like they were part of the Nazi party, but it's not like they're Nazis kind of like circumstantial Nazis (laughs) as a survival thing. Right. Not not necessarily like this isn't like where the U.S. was hiring Dr. Mangler or anything. Not that being Nazis is, like, good. Oh, God, I'm, I'm digging myself a Let me get you a shovel. But... <laughs> no, I understand what you're saying. But... That, that, again, not to excuse it, and there's, you know, there's definitely a big push for silence is uh, endorsement in a way if you're stuck in Nazi Germany. But at the same time, if speaking out just gets you killed, then this was perhaps a way for them to survive by saying or basically towing the line. And then after the war, they can be a little more free to speak out or leave the country. And yes, like you said, they were technically Nazis, but not advocates for the cause. I guess maybe the PC way to say it. Yeah. Again, so yeah, it kind of just goes through the jet engine and the sound barrier thing and then with the Mercury astronaut thing. So, but but first with the sound barrier stuff, a big thing that they highlight in in the movie and and the book goes even more into it, but just how common it was for these test pilots to die in the line of their work. 
And oh, yeah. I didn't see the stats online, but like the wives were saying in the movie that like every time they go up, there's a one in four chance of dying. And they said something like, didn't they say something like 60 deaths in 30 weeks at one point? Or like, it's just, I thought those were the numbers, but it's like, how would anybody in their right mind go up if those were the numbers? Oh yeah. I, I don't, I, I have no idea. But regardless of the actual stats, risk of death was a real, real threat and something that kept the wives up at night. And the men were just kind of like, honestly, I compare with when you look at the swagger these guys had, I can't help compare them to like, I would say NFL wide receivers kind of seem to be the ones with the most swagger. And no matter how many best ever college players will come in and just be average in the NFL, the next rookie always thinks he's now the greatest thing ever despite the fact that people who have gone before him have failed or not lived up to the hype. They still always think they're the ones going to live up to the hype. So I see that in these test pilots. Yeah, they would see other best-in-the-world pilots go up and die, and then it wouldn't phase them because they still think they're the best in the world and that that guy just didn't have it and wasn't as good as me. And I'm I'm not going to die because I'm better than that guy, even though he's one of the best in the world too. Yes. And and that's why I was kind of most epitomized by uh, Gordon Cooper, played by... oh. Gosh, dang, I still might have the name by the time I got to the end of the sentence. <laughs> um, Dennis Quaid. Yeah, Dennis Quaid. <laughs> <laughs> Pictured him the whole time. And uh, he just kind of has the, you know, proverbial, I guess, shitting and grin throughout <laughs> throughout the movie there. And and the, that's another thing that they kind of oversimplify. The, the, the movie kind of has everybody too conveniently all together when the recruiters come around. And kind of has yes. them even there at the same time as Jaeger and... They kind of go in expecting Jaeger's our guy. Jaeger would be the perfect guy to put as the face as the first Mercury astronaut. And he's like, not interested. Kind of because he right. recognizes that it's just putting someone on top of a rocket and they don't have anything to do. They're not flying yeah. the thing. They're sitting in the front of the rocket. He's like, no, thanks. Not interested. Right. And these rockets that they're using, they were not purpose designed for space travel. These are ballistic missiles, literally <laughs> missiles that they just take a warhead off of and put a space capsule on top of. Yes. I think the first flight was on a Redstone rocket, and then they ended up using Atlas rockets later. But yeah, those those are missiles. <laughs> right. And so what the movie, I don't think, fully highlighted as much as the book did for me, although it makes sense if you think about it. But like, so the first couple guys that go up, so you have Alan Shepard goes up first. Yep. And then it was uh, Gus second. Yeah, that's right, because Gr- uh, yes, Gus had yes, the, hats, Gus was ha- had the hatches incident. So yes. all they're doing, like you said, so there's going up on a rocket into space, the capsule, or the one, or you know, it's kind of like everything else. The propulsion stuff is dropped off. The capsule then continues up into space, but then it's just a parabola, like any projectile, and then it just goes in space and then falls back down and splashes in the ocean. Yep. So it's just one giant parabola where the top of that did technically enter outer space for a little bit. Yes, which at the time there were so. This is this is kind of taking a step back for a second. But so when Chuck Yeager broke the sound barrier, he did it in a plane uh, nicknamed the Glamorous Glennis. It was a, a Bell X1, which side note to this side note, <laughs> the, the real the real uh, Bell X1 that was actually flown. The first plane flown fast and speed of sound is at the Smithsonian the Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C., but the one used in the movie is at the Kansas Cosmosphere and Space Center in Hutchinson, Kansas. Oh, and I okay, I had I actually had this pulled up on Wikipedia here too, and I guess they hadn't. So I've probably seen it before, unless it's been there just put there recently. No, it's been there. It's been there since they. I think since they made the movie. Okay, at least since the nineties, because I remember okay. seeing it when I was like a kid. Well, we we do kind of forget because it, it is so close geographically that the Cosmosphere and Hutch is probably basically the second biggest space museum in the country, right? Besides the Smithsonian. Yes, and I yeah. Yeah. probably and um, we kind of take it take it for granted because it's just kind of right there and you know it's a museum well, I, mean, I, I don't I've, I've i've been there but i've been there as recently as like 2014 so oh dang okay um <laughs> I, I think i went not too long ago for like a star wars thing <laughs> they had there <laughs> um <laughs> But anyway, so the Bell X-1 was the first plane in a series of planes, which actually still continues to today. Um, basically, now any experimental aircraft that the U.S. has gets a designation X hmm. and then a number. But so at the at the time of the movie, there was, in addition to going into space on a rocket, there was uh, also, as part of this uh, X-plane program, there was a, uh, a plane that could actually get you to the altitude you needed to be considered in outer space. And there were actually pilots that flew this plane that got astronaut wings oh. for their uniform that were not like that didn't get launched into space on a rocket. 
So it's the uh, North American X-15, which one of the uh, the pilots in the early days of that program was a uh, Neil Armstrong. Oh, dang. Okay. But yeah, it was basically like this super, super fast rocket plane that they would hang underneath a big like bomber aircraft, kind of like you see in the movie where they're literally like they're holding the plane underneath another plane and they drop it and then just turn the rockets on right right because it probably couldn't take off like normal on its own or you'd be wasting all your fuel i guess on the ground just to right. get up in the air so with, with the planes that could get almost a space thing like you're saying is that similar to what they show jaeger do at the end where he kind of breaks through the atmosphere and sees stars for a little bit of course then it also seems uh, to stall at his plane kind of I, I don't know how how high he was at that point but yeah it's basically the same thing because yeah they, they would fly this you know those bomber aircraft basically as high as it could go drop the rocket plane turn the engines on and then you know just go up higher and once you hit um, an altitude of 50 miles that's the the line that they say is space and so if you go above that you get you, you say i went to space and what's fascinating is I, our just our perceptions in day-to-day life kind of, I think, make space seem at more of a distance than it is. So obviously, oh, I can see the stars at night, but not during the day. But the only reason you can't see them during the day is, well, one, the light of the sun drowns them out, and then the refraction of the sun's light into blue, and it just kind of blocks the stars. They're still there all the time. And like you said, just 50 miles from being through the atmosphere to where you would be able to see everything like nighttime space all the time. We're in space. I mean, Earth is just floating around in space it's not this separate thing like it's where we live (laughs) yes (laughs) so really it's all about just leaving earth's atmosphere is the designation to then be where we are anyway i don't know you know what i'm saying (laughs) they they actually they made a joke about that in the most recent season of uh rick and morty morty says something about how he's like he's worried about something being in space and rick says literally everything is in space (laughs) exactly There really isn't any overall arching plot other than it is kind of just the race with the Russians and the ending point is just being a montage voiceover at the end, honestly, which is almost kind of like out of nowhere. I almost think they didn't handle that well. So they kind of use Glenn's orbital flight as kind of the climax of the movie and getting him back safely. But then following that, it is just kind of the denouement of celebrating the guys, saying that they all got their chance to go up. And it does kind of have this button at the end with with Jaeger's near death experience, which which is accurate. I mean, Chuck Jaeger, Jaeger did nearly die and have to eject when yep. his uh, plane stalled out there. But yes, plot wise, that's a, that's that's essentially the movie. I mean, it, it just kind of deals with what these guys dealt with. You know, there was the issue with Gus Grissom and the hatch that blew when he landed in the water and caused the capsule to sink, where they couldn't salvage it. Which the whole point of putting it up there was to collect scientific data that was lost when it was submerged. And here's what's interesting: both the book and the movie kind of point the finger at Gus even though he pleads to the end that, well, to the literal end, because Gus Grissom died in an explosion uh, after the movie took place, but that he was never exonerated until after the movie came out. So that's why, or no, sorry, it was before the movie came out, but after the book was written. So in that window, they did finally exonerate Gus and say, no, yes, even though it was against all odds, it was a technical malfunction. It was not Gus's fault, even though the book had painted it Kind of like, yeah, it probably was his fault, even though he won't own up to it. And the movie just based it off the book in that however many, there was just a few years, I think, between the, the book coming out and I had probably about 10 years between the book coming out and the, and the movie coming out. He was exonerated. Yeah, the Liberty Bell 7 crash. Yeah, I, and the movie kind of accurately shows that like even his, even Gus Grissom's wife thought that he like blew the hash because he got nervous. And that's a there was a, a, a astronauts didn't like that they portrayed Gus as being nervous in the capsule, right? Because it it does kind of leave it ambiguous because it shows him like getting nervous and you know he's like starting to sweat and he's like you know taking off his helmet he's like real jittery and then it like getting claustrophobic an, basically right and then it shows an outside view of the capsule and the hatch blowing right but so they they don't technically show him blowing the hatch but they all but show him blowing the hatch right and with how everyone treats him afterward and how he's acting you just kind of it's kind of pointing the finger without directly pointing the finger yeah right but uh yeah i guess one of the uh the main pieces of evidence showing that he did not blow the hatch on purpose was when wally shara flew his mercury mission in october of 1962 sigma 7 i get when they got his capsule onto the flight deck of the ship that it was on 
he blew the hatch on purpose and showed that there were like it leaves some sort of like distinctive mark on the trigger or something. Oh, and Gus's didn't have that. Right. Right. Which is actually that's probably what didn't exonerate Gus, which is the, but that was after the book came out. Yeah, well, cuz the uh the capsule itself was it sunk to the bottom of the ocean. Right. And it wasn't recovered until 1999. Oh, they did recover it. Yeah. And again, uh, another Cosmosphere connection. When they recovered it in 1999, they brought it to uh, the Cosmosphere, and that's where they restored it. Okay. So they, they disassembled it, cleaned all the parts and everything to make sure it didn't rust, reassembled it, and it's actually still on display there. You can huh. go see the actual capsule. Which I've probably seen, but it's like, if you don't have the story, uh, the context, it just doesn't mean as much, honestly, when it's just like, here's a random thing from space, versus, no, here's the whole story behind it. I think that makes it a lot, a lot more interesting. Yeah. So the end of the movie, I even even wrote in my notes here, the voiceover about Gordo at the end is dumb. Like, this is such a good movie and so well done that they just have this tacky, out-of-nowhere voiceover talking about a character who's not even the main character saying, yep, and Gordo got a chance to go to space too. Like, what? Like, it just is so out of the tone of the rest of the movie, and it kind of just threw, I mean, I think it's a really, really bad way to end a really, really good movie. But... Like I said, everything else is great. From the you know the, the the casting is, I thought, amazing. Not just the guys themselves and how good they do, but I even you know even wrote the the guy playing LBJ and Eisenhower. I mean, dude, that dude looked like Eisenhower. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I was gonna. I I had that written down. I don't know who they got like as casting. You know, the the astronauts are are mostly just like pretty well known like character actors. But like the guy who looks like Warren von Braun looks a lot like Warner von Braun, but specifically, yeah, Eisenhower and LBJ, like yes, whoever, like I, those guys. I don't know if they have played LBJ and Eisenhower in other movies, but they should. <laughs> right, because they can make they can make a living at it for sure. So oh, I, I just found the uh, this thing about so uh, yeah, when when Wally Shira flew Sigma Seven, he deliberately blew the hatch after it was on the deck of the recovery ship, and the when you fire it, the trigger kicks back and it injured his hand. And mm. it, that was what he was expecting to happen. And so in Gus Grissom's post-flight physical, there is no evidence of an injury to his hand. And there was no like that kickback mechanism. You know, it, it didn't leave any kind of there was no evidence that it, it had been activated. So there was like actual evidence that uh, Gus Grissom, exactly like he said, the hatch just blew accidentally. OK, you're not going to believe this. <laughs> the dude who played Eisenhower is a man named Robert Beer. He has exactly three acting credits to his name in which he played Eisenhower, Eisenhower, Eisenhower. I totally believe that. So that's how much the dude looked like Eisenhower. He's not even an actor, apparently. He just played Eisenhower in three different movies. <laughs> that's crazy. So yeah, so something called... What, Amer- are, the, what Amer- are the three movies? Americathon, The Right Stuff, and My Science Project. Okay, I've never even heard of the no, other two. No, right. That's uh, it doesn't even list his age or anything. Like the dude did three movies in which he played Eisenhower in all three because he's a dead ringer for Dwight Eisenhower <laughs> and apparently not yeah. not actually an actor outside of that. <laughs> so he basically got an Eisenhower impersonator and maybe he does stage stuff or something. But I just thought that's kind of uncanny. How many actors have played uh, one character in every movie role? <laughs> <laughs> so okay, so before we talk about like just we'll talk briefly about the awards here, but I did want to hit again on the humor in the movie because. We already mentioned it, but I, I even wrote down multiple kind of just jokes that they had in the, the play. It's like, is it before Shepard or no, I think it's before Glenn's flight where someone had put a sign in the capsule that said no handball in this area. Yeah, that was uh, uh, an Alan Shepard before the first uh, Alan Shepard, his first flight. OK. And of course, just yeah. obviously the capsule is, you know, the size of a chair. You have a chair right. and a panel yes. in front of you. And so, yes. of course, the warning sign for no handball. And then, of course, again, this is something that really happened. But. So they didn't consider if if the astronauts needed to use the restroom because and the engineers right. even the movie say it's like it's a fifteen minute flight why would you use the bathroom? It's a fifteen minute flight, right? Exactly. But they yeah they didn't ex- you know delays and everything. Right. So you did you had him on the launch pad for four hours. So yeah. he needs to pee, and then the whole debate of should he just pee in his suit? Will that compromise everything? But no, that actually happened, and of course the, and they the, do. I mean, and and the movie kind of like. It, it almost turns into like a like an Edgar Wright style like visual yes, comedy at or that something point out of uh, Austin Powers. 
Yeah, where they they show like the guys, you know, the guy with the fire hose and like people pouring coffee and like the yes. cup blowing and yeah. Um, just again, just kind of having fun with it. And the other joke was uh, again going back to Harry Shearer again. For those who don't know, Harry Shearer is the voice of like literally one fourth of all characters on The Simpsons. Yes, he's also the bassist from This Is Spinal Tap. Correct, which would have came out just a couple years after this or the year after this. Yeah, and okay, well, so two things on that. One, when him and Goldblum are going just kind of their deadpan back and forth, they're showing some of the Russian scientists and they're arguing over which one is which. And just, oh. they're kind of almost fighting over like, oh, it's this guy's on the left. No, this guy's on the left. And it's almost funny that they keep fighting over it because it doesn't matter at all to the movie or to the right. people in the room. But Harry Shearer just completely dead, deadpan saying, uh, well, they do bear a great resemblance to each other. <laughs> and honestly, so because they're kind of showing these little, this almost documentary footage, because it's just kind of footage of the Russian scientists, with Harry Shearer doing the voiceover, it seems like a scene out of The Simpsons. Because yes. how many scenes of The Simpsons, just exactly done that exact way, would have Harry right. Shearer doing the voiceover as one of the many characters? I don't know. That's just almost kind of a neat uh, Easter egg. And actually, I'm yes. going to pull up his full list of names, because... Just saying he does a quarter of the voices on The Simpsons is not doing it justice here. And speaking of, of sure, he's in a scene with the uh, real life Chuck Yeager, who, which we, we talked about this last week off the air. But Chuck Yeager, uh, number one, he's still alive. As of recording. <laughs> at, yes, at time of recording. And yeah, number two, Chuck Yeager is in the movie. In the uh, in the scene when they Poncho's bar and they're talking to the test pilots and, and Shearer's talking to one of the like their handler. I don't know if handler is the right word. He's I I don't know his his the actor's name or the the guy in the movie, but it's the scene where the guy says so you're telling me you don't want our best pilots, and he said, well, we want the best pilots that we can get. <laughs> and there's a guy, there's like an old guy standing behind him, and he said, you know, he comes up to him, he's like, you guys want some whiskey? Shira says, oh, I'll have a Coca Cola, please, in a clean glass. <laughs> so the old guy, guy there the is, old Chuck guy is Chuck Yeager. Oh, I yeah. didn't know that. So Harry Shearer's voices on The Simpsons. Principal Skinner, Kent Brockman, Mr. Burns, Smithers, Ned Flanders, Reverend Lovejoy, Dr. Hibbert, Scratchy, and others that I don't recognize as well. But yes, he's, again, about one quarter of the voices on on The Simpsons. Yeah. One other uh, humorous thing that I like that they do in the movie is when they're talking about, which is, this is like something that is, I, I guess, common with these astronauts is some of them will like a lot of them will use their middle name as their first name. And like, that's how you know them. So like mm. Scott Carpenter's real name is Malcolm Scott Carpenter. Okay. Gordo Cooper. His first name's actually Leroy. But in the movie, they're talking about, you know, they're going through the, also when they're talking about how much money they're paying them, which was also kind of crazy. That, oh, yes. Uh, they were getting like $7,000 a year or something was their salary. And then when they became astronauts, they got, uh, it was like half a million split seven ways over three years. When part of that was the money they got from Time Magazine or Life Magazine. Right. That Right. That's that's what they were specifically talking about, I think, in that scene. Um, but the the guy says uh, Virgil I. Grissom and, and Gus Grissom <laughs> says, Gus, nobody calls me by that other name. He goes, Gus, we, we can have an astronaut named Gus. He says, what's your middle name? He says, Ivan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, which is, of course, Russian, which they don't really talk about. Right. Yeah. And, he goes, and he just looks at him. He goes, OK. You can be Gus. <laughs> and I'm just like, it's his freaking name. Of course he can be Gus. Yeah. Well, it's, it's not. His name is Virgil Virgil Ivan Grissom. Oh, yeah, true. But he goes by Gus. Gus yeah, is just, yeah, I know you're right. Just yeah. But, yeah. So, at the Oscars, so the right stuff is from 1983, and this would probably be one of the ones you would call a bad beat. So, it was, let me pull it up here. So, it was nominated for eight Oscars and won four. Now it won for the technical stuff. It, it won. It won music, sound effects, best sound, film editing. So even like two different sound categories, and of course the sound with all the rockets and stuff is amazing, especially for 1983 when you think about both the jets and the and the rockets and everything. Um, but it's also nominated for best picture, best supporting actor, Sam Shepard, who played Alan Shepard, right? Scott Glenn played Alan Shepard. Sam Shepard played Chuck Yeager. Oh, that's right. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, best cinematography and best art and set decoration. Okay, I guess it didn't have a Best Directing nomination, but when I'm still looking at the Oscars for this year, the fact that this movie that won four and got nominated for eight lost to Terms of Endearment, just, I don't know, doesn't doesn't sit well with me. Let me see what else was nominated that year. So it was Terms of Endearment, The Big Chill, The Dresser, Tender Mercies, and The Right Stuff. I mean, it's probably kind of ridiculous Right Stuff didn't win, 
Yeah. And it definitely, this movie definitely stands up. Like it's, it holds up better than any of those. Yeah. And I haven't, I mean, the big chill is pretty good. I, I haven't re- rewatched turns of endearing in a long time, but I mean, it's just, it's kind of a tear jerker and it might stand. I don't know. It's, it's a bunch of fine movies and the right stuff. Right. And, and even looking at the, using the rotten tomato test. So the right stuff is a 98%. Terms of Endearment is a respectable 84. But again, it's just, I just don't think it's as impactful or as important of a movie. One more kind of like thing I wanted to mention, because I, I don't know, um, I, I don't think we have any other movies dealing with space travel. Well, obviously, this is the last episode this season, but I think even next season, there's no like NASA movies, right? Right. Yeah, I, I don't think, I, don't, I didn't plan up. on doing Apollo 13 or anything as of this time. Planned yeah. at time of recording, I right, guess I should right. say. So. The seven astronauts that this movie follows, you know, the the Mercury 7, Scott Carpenter, Gordon Cooper, John Glenn, Gus Grissom, Wally Schirra, Alan Shepard, and Deke Slayton, most of them went on to fly additional space missions. So probably the the most famous one would have, would be uh, Gus Grissom uh, was supposed to fly uh, on Apollo 1. That was the mission where there was an explosion in the capsule or a fire in the capsule like right prior to launch and all three astronauts were killed. The only one of these seven that didn't fly a Mercury mission was Deke Slayton because he had some sort of heart issue. But then he ended up later on in his career, he was a mission commander for the Apollo Soyuz test project in 1975, um, which I have, I actually have a uh, Apollo Soyuz test project t-shirt. But anyway, that was like a cooperation mission between the U S and the Soviet union uh, in 1975, where they had an Apollo capsule and a uh, Soyuz spacecraft that docked in outer space. And it was like this big thing for international space cooperation. Alan Shepard is the only one of these guys that ended up walking on the moon. He was uh, on Apollo 11, or sorry, Apollo 14 in, uh, in 1971. Wally Schirra flew uh, on the first actual uh, Apollo mission that had people in it that went to space, which was Apollo 7. And then uh, last but certainly not least, as a uh, yeah, personal hero of mine, John Glenn, who uh, he's a, a Marine like they show in the movie. He's a fighter pilot and uh, served in both World War Two and Korea, you know, flew a, a whole bunch of combat missions and then was one of the first astronauts. He was the first person, first American to orbit the Earth. And then he is the oldest person to fly in space. He flew on a space shuttle mission in 1998 while he was a senator. So he was a senator from Ohio. And while he was a he was a sitting senator and flew a space shuttle mission when he was 77 years old. So just yeah, just just died a few years ago at the age of 95. Yeah, 2016. Yeah, is when he died, and so I think too. I think part of the reason I was you know so shocked that Jaeger is still alive is because his big accomplishment came a decade before these guys' accomplishments. But he's is about their age too, or even a little younger. He just happened to do something before. So yeah, so he he was about twenty four when he broke the sound barrier. So he's pretty young. Whereas these guys were in their thirties when they were doing you know that stuff a decade later. So they're about the same age. Right. Yeah. Because yeah, there you go. So. Jaeger's 96 now, almost 97, versus John Glenn was 95 a few years ago. So yeah, he was actually a little bit younger than these guys. And the movie, I don't think, really illustrates that, too. Doesn't it kind of seem like they kind of build Jaeger up to be not necessarily older, but definitely more established right. than those guys? And I, I don't I don't know the... Uh, well, he was definitely more famous than any of these guys. Right. Because at the time, he's, he's Chuck Jaeger, you know, test pilot extraordinaire, first man to break the sound barrier. So even if he was, you know, 10 or so years younger than these guys, he was definitely, you know, had more clout as far as the aviation community was concerned. But yeah, there, so there's, we come across people every now and then in this in this podcast who, you know, I kind of think like, man, this this person might have the most amazing, the most interesting career, the most interesting life of of anyone maybe in history. I mean, oh, obviously, that's, right. that's a hard thing to quantify. Right. And you've said it a couple of times, but it's still definitely all the all those those guys are all nominees for sure. So I'm getting Glenn is right. definitely up well, there for you. I, well, I was, I was going to say specifically John Glenn, you know, like fighter pilot hero in two wars and then an astronaut and then an astronaut again in his 70s. And he did it while being a senator. Like <laughs> Right. And actually, so that's the last thing I think probably worth talking about here in the movie is something we haven't touched on yet is the morality issue that comes up. 
So they show these young women who seem to be making a point of trying to sleep with all the Mercury astronauts. And when they approach John Glenn's table, it then cuts to him reprimanding the other guys because he's kind of the clean-cut all-American boy who doesn't stand for such shenanigans. And, and the book dealt with this too, even more so. But I thought it was a very interesting debate. And you kind of have the two camps of John Glenn saying... We're better than that. We need to be by the, you know, basically on the up and up and just super squeaky clean because of what we represent versus. Well, and also because he doesn't want like something else, you know, on the side. He actually in the movie, he calls it the Mickey Mouse. You know, he he doesn't want any any Mickey Mouse casting a bad light or introducing Jeopardy into the space program as a whole because it was it's not like nasa now like this was the beginning you know, stages very much a new right. thing and right and public opinion had to remain high especially because this was like you know the space race with the soviets so i think you know the morality thing was important but just as important was the fact that he didn't want a bad light being cast on the space program right right and then shepherd's argument that i actually think he makes very eloquently is Basically, screw you, I have the right to do whatever I want, right? and it shouldn't be anybody's business what I do in my private time, end of story, full stop, and gets pretty aggressive in voicing that opinion. And honestly, something like that is tied to today when you talk about, you know, what role should celebrities play as quote unquote role models, and they're just people, but they are in the spotlight, so what moral responsibility do they have to be? a role model. And I just thought that was kind of interesting seeing, you know, a version of that debate that took place in the, you know, late fifties, early sixties with these initial yeah. astronauts and some of the first people maybe do put under such scrutiny because I mean, think even, I mean, yeah, athletes were there too. And Hollywood celebrities were there too, but Hollywood's always kind of come with a little bit of scandal that can become almost like expected versus these right. guys were put up as the best of the best and then actually what we should end on is talking about what the right stuff means because that ties into this conversation a little bit as well and the whole idea of the right stuff which the movie doesn't super explore and i couldn't find the passages in the passages in the book where they detailed it all out but really it was the unknown qualities we were looking for in a potential astronaut because we didn't necessarily know what was going to be needed of these people so we just need to find someone who had it but like right. every it like they needed to be masters of everything to have the right stuff to be an astronaut and that's right basically they, what it comes down to they needed to be like yeah very intelligent very technically savvy know about you know aviation and commodore pressure physically strong right right yeah physically physically they needed to be in you know in outstanding shape uh, good under pressure and then also morally upstanding like we can't have any issues scandals it, yeah so it, it's basically a list of like you have to check every single thing in the box right and they show kind of going through the process and they don't actually you know super detail it but you know our seven guys you know make it through but as they were going through that selection process, all the guys that dropped out because they didn't have the right stuff. Even if they were great right. on a million, you made a great pilot. But once you get these kind of G forces, they're just going to be a whole different level. Nope, they pass right. out. Sorry. Or or they they're a good pilot and they're they're in good shape and they can do the G forces. But when they locked them inside of that little safe, you know, inside of that little like small room. For days at a time they freaked out they got all claustrophobic i was right. like okay well that's something that you don't have that we need right so you know so you're out right you're almost looking for a superhuman level of of american yep and jaeger even brings us up because there there's a scene where they're it's right after they send the chimp to space and they're all watching on tv and the, all the other pilots are like making fun of them like oh look it's a it's a it's a chimp in the capsule and oh, look, the astronauts you know they're 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 basically just chimps oh you know, yes you know they're they're basically just just monkeys that uh spam in a can you know they're yes. just they're just sitting there they don't actually have to do anything and chuck yeager says no that there's a huge difference the difference is the, the monkey doesn't know that he's sitting yes. on a rocket that can blow up underneath him you know he he has has no idea what he's in for but all of the astronauts you know not only do they know they specifically volunteered for it and so that's the the right stuff and pretty cool that yeager is saying basically these guys are braver than I am and no one right. could ever doubt Jaeger's bravery for a second. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yes, with the right stuff bringing us into the 1960s and the beginnings of the space age, 
that brings season three of history and film to a close and i do think it's neat how each season we've progressively covered less and less time partly just because we know more about recent history than we know about the past and then in turn there are more movies made about more recent things than there are about things from hundreds and thousands of years ago so we're up through the 1960s and this fall election day again 2020 here we will pick back up with the final season of this project and trying to get basically world history in 100 movies and we'll carry through to roughly the present day at least to the internet era and We'll pick back up the 1960s before continuing through to the modern day with our final 25 or so movies. So, thanks everybody for listening. Thank you, Logan, for being with me this season and making it a lot more enjoyable, even if it is a lot more work editing now. <laughs> it's a blast. Yeah. <laughs> hey, blast is a great word to end the season on with, uh, with the right stuff here. It, it has been yeah. a blast. We will catch you later, everybody.